Welcome to Myth and Mission. We're back at it and we're going to return to an already familiar text now, the Enuma Elish. The point of this is to try to get a sense of how utterly unique the Bible is in its own cultural context and how it is utterly unique in our own. And that's our point. We want to recover how beautiful God says he is, we are, his creation is, it gives us hope and it enlivens our message with a sense of urgency. Here we go back into the Enuma Elish, an ancient Babylonian creation myth. Let me set the stage a little bit. These creation myths that were around Israel, right? So there's Israel and there's Israel's neighbors. And Israel's neighbors, many of them believe the world was created essentially out of uh, some sort of conflict with the deities. You see, they didn't believe in just one God. They believed in a whole pantheon, a bunch of gods that had competing interests, factions, sexual affairs. It was a whole big soap opera up there in the sky. So what is their view of how the universe got created. They saw it coming from a divine conflict between uh, some of their hero pantheon like Ea and Marduk and some of the bad guy pantheon, including Tiamat and Kingu. So uh, Tiamat is this chaos dragon goddess who kind of symbolized this, uh, the chaoticness of the sea. A lot of these deities were kind of personifiable through nature. So let's see what happens in this divine warfare. This is their answer to how the cosmos was made. We're slipping right into the middle of this divine battle, so don't let that disorient you too much. Here we are. Tiamat is speaking here with her uh, cohort about some of the drama that's unfolded in this warfare, and here's where they decide to throw down. Tiamat was confounded day and night. She was frantic. The gods took no rest. They and the text kind of falls out there. In their minds, they plotted evil and addressed their mother Tiamat. When Apsu, your spouse, was killed, you did not go at his side, but said quietly, The four dreadful winds have been fashioned to throw you into confusion, and we cannot sleep. You gave no thought to Apsu, your spouse, nor to Mumu, who is a prisoner. Now you sit alone. Henceforth you will be in frantic consternation. And as for us who cannot rest... You do not love us. Consider our burden. Our eyes are hollow. Break the immovable yoke that we may sleep. Make battle. Avenge them. And again, the text drops out. Reduce to nothingness. Tiamat heard. The speech pleased her. She said, let us make demons as you have advised. The gods assembled within her. They conceived evil against the gods, their begetters. They... The text drops out and took the side of Tiamat, fiercely plotting, unresting by day and night, lusting for battle, raging, storming. They set up a host to bring about conflict. Eventually, this conflict, this restless, chaotic uh, faction within the deities, they get defeated by gods like Marduk, who splits Tiamat's body open, and thus the earth is the slain body of Tiamat. This is how it unfolds. Marduk is our, our hero. He's also known as Bel, Bel Marduk. So if you if you see that name pop up, that's, that's the same dude. Here's the end of that battle. You ready? He let loose the evil wind, the rear guard, in her face. Tiamat opened her mouth to swallow it. She let the evil wind in so that she could not close her lips. The fierce winds weighed down her belly. Her innards were distended and she opened her mouth wide. He let fly an arrow and pierced her belly. He tore open her entrails and slit her innards. He bound her and extinguished her life. He threw down her corpse and stood on it. Then later on in another tablet, here's Marduk, remember Bell, Marduk. Bell placed his feet on the lower parts of Tiamat and with his merciless club smashed her skull. He severed her arteries, skipping down a few lines. Bell rested, surveying the corpse in order to divide the lump by a clever scheme. He split her into two like a dried fish. One half of her he set up and stretched as the heavens. He stretched the skin and appointed a watch with the instruction not to let her waters escape. So the text describes... Marduk making the heavens and the earth with a divided body. Yes, there is some intention here, but it's just this uh, afterthought, 
aftermath repurposing of a divine goddess's corpse. That's what creation is. This is how the Babylonians described creation, kind of like an aftermath of some sort of divine warfare that was about the sleeplessness of the gods and some rebellion against them. So how, how do we make sense of this? There's a wonderful little work by a man named John Curid against the gods. And here's his take. The Enuma Elish teaches that the creation began as a cosmic struggle between order and chaos. So when we think about the myth, the answer to the story of the, some of the deepest questions that humans have, like what is the world around us? What does it mean? Well, here's, the story that the Enuma Elish tells. Our world came from cosmic struggle. And not just cosmic struggle, this was like the struggle between different deities and sub-deities and... Uh, are you happy with this answer? Does this answer life's biggest questions about how the universe got here? Are you satisfied? Are you inspired? Are you hopeful? Your ultimate purpose is to serve the gods as an enslaved blood clot in the aftermath of a divine warfare. I'm not terribly pleased with that, that viewpoint. Are, are you? Good. I didn't think so. That's why we're going to go to the Bible, and I promise you you're going to find some deep encouragement here. Let's dive in to Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. So skipping ahead through the days of creation, they'll be really familiar to many of us. And if you want to check it out, just continue reading in Genesis 1. Let's pick up at the end of the chapter. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. There was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Do you feel the intentionality and the care of this. Th this doesn't begin with divine conflict. It begins with the blank canvas of the watery deeps. This is an artist bringing into being what he, he wants, his desires. He wants to share himself with the cosmos. Do you hear the care and the tenderness and the intentionality of God versus something say that the Babylonians would have been used to hearing, that the cosmos was some sort of wasteland of evidence of divine warfare. There's no sense of conflict here in the beginning for God. You know, it's really interesting. I got a quote from a book called Rediscovering the Holy Spirit. Michael Horton uses a phrase that Calvin used to describe God's intentionality in this scene with the Holy Spirit of God hovering over the waters. What is this trying to convey? Uh, let's read. The scene of the Holy Spirit hovering over creation's chaos, cherishing the confused mass in Calvin's description. Horton, like Calvin, goes on to talk about the motherly aspect of the Spirit, nurturing and creating something and bringing it to life bringing out the vision of, of what is in God's heart and, and making it happen, preparing a place for his presence. 
And this is what God is doing. There's a couple of key touchstones we can dive into here if we really attend to the text. There's this word that he blessed. We read he blesses humanity and he also blesses the creatures. And this word for blessing, it's it's a really rich concept in Hebrew. And, and, and it comes to this idea of kneeling to consecrate something. And he's setting it apart to, for God to the first thing for him to say to his his created creatures and and his humans that are bearing his image is to bless them uh, you, you're talking about God wanting wanting to to just cherish and value and to bestow something of himself in in these things this is amazing God is setting apart uh, consecrating things for his presence. And this idea of God's presence being a a central theme in the creation account is augmented by this whole seven day thing. I know many of us who have a a scientific Western perspective on the story of the universe, uh, we struggle with this idea of seven days. And I just want to say that in its cultural context, the genre of Genesis 1 and 2, there's something very interestingly theological happening here. And there's a guy who points this out really well. John Walton, The Lost World of Genesis 1, he talks about the idea of a temple building happening here, that temple building text. If we look, again, like we're looking at a creation myth, it's a parallel, it's a it's an alternative story from Israel's neighbors. Uh, we look at temple building texts around Israel's uh, neighbors, and what we find is that temples were described as being built in seven days. And so uh, whether or not we take it literally, the genre expectations of its of its literary world what is being conveyed by creation being made in seven days is something theological that in fact the cosmos is the dwelling place the temple of god we explore this in a brief table talk video here check it out it's on this youtube page what is the origin story of the creation, the, the, the cosmos, the universe, according to the scriptures. Well, you know, we could really boil it down and say something like this. Our world came from God's heart. Do you hear the intentionality of God that he is preparing an, a, a space for his presence to dwell and to be shared by created beings, including and especially the capstone of that creation, humanity. That we would also participate in representing him and being priests in this cosmic temple that is the cosmos of his presence. Isn't that an encouraging answer to how we got here? That the reason for all of this, when we look up at the night sky and we wonder, and we feel so small, when we, when we study the intricacies of the, the worlds yet to be explored beneath the sea um, and, and, and at the tops of, of mountains that are so difficult to reach or, or the moon or Mars or all of these amazing places deep, deep, deep in space and we look and we survey all of that and, and the Enuma Elish would, would say, this is the result of a divine battle. This is the aftermath, the wasteland of a war. And we Christians can look and survey the cosmos with a sense that this was built to be the temple of the living God. And that he wants to share his heart himself with it and with us. Is that not an encouraging answer to what this is all about. It's not just unique in its own cultural context. It's unique today as well. But before we dive into more modern myths, if you will, I want to sink into another question about this creation. It's not just how we got here, but what is the creation? How are we supposed to view it? We might pose the question like this, how does God view his creation and how should we? Again, one of these big themes, reference that video, is the idea of of the cosmos being God's temple, 
check it out. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I want to compare it to another of Israel's neighbors, another parallel. There's something called the Baal cycle. You're probably familiar with the word Baal uh, from the many accounts and kings with interactions with different Canaanite deities and Israel's continual worshiping of these idols. But they had a story in Ugarit. This is a a, a city that would have been in Canaan, and there was the archaeological discovery of a lot of texts there that actually interacted with the very deities that the Bible talks about Israel being infatuated with. And so there was this idea of the Baal cycle. It's a, a text that described this cosmic drama between deities that were kind of personified nature. There was a storm god, Baal, and there was a drought god, Mot. And they were in this kind of cyclical war. Essentially, one of the theories on this is that what they were describing was understanding the created world, right? Every place has seasons. And so in this, in this time and place in the world, in the Levant, they would have uh, a dry season and a, and, a, and, a, and a rainy season. And so they made sense of this with this myth this idea that the deities were at some sort of warfare. And so the storm god, Baal, was at war with Mot, and that every year, every season, he would he would be in, invited and, and trapped into uh, Mot, the drought god's uh, lair, and, and the, the storms would disappear. And, and with some help from some of the higher deities on the storm god's side, Baal would be freed and the storms and the rains would come. You get a little glimpse of this concept in 1 Kings 18 on the Mount Carmel episode. You got Elijah mocking the priests of Baal because they're like, is he asleep? <laughs> is he using the bathroom? Like, where is he at? And this was actually part of their myth that, that he was trapped. And so when there was a long period of drought, it was this kind of like, when is the cycle going to happen again? W why am I diving into this parallel and this exploration of creation? Well, maybe this will make sense. Let me read this real quick. In Canaanite mythology, Mot, the god of death, battled and briefly won against Baal, the god of fertility and life, before being defeated and killed by Anath, Baal's sister, who would resurrect Baal in time to bring life to the land. In spite of Baal's survival, Mot's rebirth would inevitably take place, and this cyclical battle would continue. Like many gods within the pantheon of Canaanite mythology, Mot was a god that symbolized a vital part of the cycle of seasons. And so here's what I want to get at. For so many of Israel's neighbors, they actually were worshiping different deities that were symbolizing the processes of creation. The storm god, the moon god, the sun god, Egypt for Babylon, for Assyria, for these guys, the, the fish god, all of, all of these local deities, a god of a certain mountain. The nature, in some ways, was worshipped. The created was personified and worshipped. And so what I, I love here is the utter uniqueness of the Bible in its cultural day. Let's return to Michael Horton and get his take. Nothing in creation is to be worshipped, but rather is meant to lead us from the artistry to the artist. Again, returning to the idea that the cosmos, all of the created world is not in and of itself a deity or deities. The processes of, of, of the cycles of seasons and storms and, and the, the cosmos and the sun and the moon, all of these things, they, they aren't self-created, self-determined beings with personality. They were created by an artist. And as beautiful and amazing and, and powerful as they are, when you think of things like the weather and the sun, they're just God's ideas. They're just his art. And so all of it is meant, all of the wonder that we, we associate with the natural world, it's supposed to point to the creator. The art makes us appreciate the artist. So let's return to our familiar modern day myth. And again, what I mean by myth is like this 
big overarching story that we can find meaning in. Uh, so, you know, there's scientific observations that are associated with this viewpoint. And I'm talking about limiting ourselves to if this is the only thing that shapes our understanding of who we are and why we're here, let's explore the Big Bang. As we know, the Big Bang uh, is, is actually, if you're catching it, it's a little bit similar to the Enuma Elish in that it is the result, This all of this, the, the cosmos, is the result of some sort of physics conflict. Maybe it's not personified and deified, but it's a big explosion. <laughs> and that's what this is. It's just an aftermath of something outside of our control. And furthermore, if there's no creator, if that's a limitation of only viewing things through the lens of the Big Bang, then there's no meaning. So what is the cosmos? What is the answer to what is the cosmos that the Big Bang might offer? We might summarize it like this. Our world came from cosmic accident. So yeah, even one step removed from the intentional warfare of deities, it's just a big explosion that happened on, on accident or some sort of equation of inevitable physics. So dialoguing with the scriptures, how are we to understand the world around us? Guys, let's boil it down. Let's learn from the scriptures and appreciate what God is saying about the world around us. Creation is meaningful. It's on purpose. God created it for a reason. He wants to dwell in it and among us. It is beloved. God blessed it. He blessed it. He wants to consecrate it, to, to care for it, to tend it, or to, to cherish the mass, the art that he's making. And we're invited to do the same. And it is sustained. You read in, in places like Psalm 104 of God's continued presence in creation, sustaining life. He is not absent. He didn't just set this up and disappear. He's here and he's in control. You guys, I hope this helps you see how beautiful, unique, how fresh, how urgent the message of the Bible is in its own cultural world and in today's, in our context, in 21st century Western culture. Do you hear the beauty? of realizing that every intricate detail of the things around us, the world, the created universe, the species, it's, it's made, crafted intentionally, meaningfully, lovingly to be a place of God's presence. Does that reframe things a bit from the stories of the Enuma Elish or the story of the Big Bang, the story of the Bible? has a rich and encouraging answer for what this is all about. May we proclaim it, may we live it, may we respond to the heart of the artist who thought of this amazing place. Godspeed.